have this really weird relationship with LinkedIn. I love it, but at the same time, like it's sometimes it's difficult. I'm not gonna lie. It's mm-hmm. it's it's relentless. It really yeah. is. Um yeah. and it's not like I don't enjoy it. I do enjoy publishing and, and creating. So it's not like oh poor woe me, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, right. But it's it it is difficult. It's not like you're publishing a blog post um, every week and there's challenges associated with that as well. But to, to keep in mind and to keep adding value, you, you know, you really do need to think, all right, what am I going to do today? How's it going to be different? How is it not going to be generic? And it does become quite a large part of your of your day, but mm-hmm. it should be because that's your marketing, isn't it? In a yep. way. And um, it's it's one of those things too, where it's like, I, I always have to remind myself that there's there's value in redundancy because mm-hmm. not everyone's going to see every post because of the algorithm, right? And there's no, certain, no. I, I, I was sick a couple of weeks ago. And so like, I took a week of less time on LinkedIn and focusing on getting better. And yeah. like, even, even the not, you know, the, their vanity metrics in a lot of ways, but like the mm-hmm. weekly, you know, my, my post views number went way down. My impressions number went way down. It's like, because I had the flu for a day, I'm being punished by the LinkedIn <laughs> algorithm, right? It's just one of those issues that we you have, have to manage. Creators through. don't don't rest, um, and I always take it with a pinch of salt when I see a, a creator talking about burnout and stuff. And it's usually like the big YouTube creators, and mm-hmm. they usually come to that point in their career where they have to have to deal with this stuff. But I can understand how it happens, you know, because if, if you are on that hamster wheel and you are consistently creating and you're checking for like feedback and metrics it it is it is a tiring it process and one day it just sneaks up on you without any warning you know and i'm quite lucky i i, I haven't reached that point yet and i still get mm-hmm. a lot of joy from from what i do but i can imagine if you're like a big youtube creator and you know you you start hitting those blocks it it must be it must be testing really really testing yeah yeah it can be it can be a challenge. And that's, that's a good segue into our overall conversation, probably. So we're gonna, we're gonna take a slightly different approach uh, to the to the podcast today. Uh, Just as a, as an FYI to our listeners, uh, we, you know, we pushed record, and we're just having a conversation, and we're just going to get started. I'll get through a little of the housekeeping items for our, our new listeners. Um, Welcome to the FYI for your institution podcast presented by Mongoose. Uh, I'm your host, Gil Rogers, uh, and today I am honored to be uh, to be joined by an amazing guest. And I hope the, the first few minutes here of this conversation helps uh, to to kind of get a good introduction. Uh, I know that the term and you know term thought leader gets thrown around a lot, and in this case, I think it fits very perfectly. Uh, I won't call you a guru because I know that word has its own connotation. Please don't call but, me a guru. <laughs> you know, I'm, I am I'm excited to welcome. Uh, founder, managing director of education marketer, Kyle Campbell. Um, Kyle's joining us from the UK. Uh, where, and for those who are listening in the podcast, we are at last, when we connected last week, I was amazed by the awesome Super Mario Brothers content in his background. Um, make, made him a little jealous. My kids are going to see it for the second time today, marching it to that billion dollar. Um, and, and hopefully Mario gets an extra life after all that. Um, so that, you know, that brings like depth, awesomeness to the, the conversation. So to that end, Kyle, I'd love for you to bring some depth and awesomeness to the conversation uh, by you know, sharing a little bit about yourself, how Education Marketer came to be, and then we're going to have our kind of unplugged, unscripted, back and forth, what drives you nuts about higher education marketing conversation, which is one of my favorite ones to have all the time. So I will kick it to you for some intros and we'll get started from there. Yeah, sure. So ed- Education Marketer for me, I think like most content gigs started as a, as a side projects I, I certainly didn't go into this with like a grand strategy um and you know as most content businesses start they they start with one one content thing don't they and mine was a newsletter and i remember sending the first issue and it had like eight subscribers which <laughs> were my friends but i've never given it any less or, or more effort i've just always created in the in the same way and as with most things they gain momentum over time and i was lucky enough to get a curve going on and you know the following week it was 10 subscribers and it's 30 subscribers and over like the the period of you know almost I don't know, it's about a year and a half two years now of doing this thing maybe more um you know i'm, I'm over the thousand subscriber mark so congratulations uh, thank you thank you i and i feel i feel like it's got to that point where 
I'm, when I'm hitting publish, I'm starting to go, oh God, there's actually going to quite a few people now. Maybe, mm-hmm. maybe I should read it over a few more times. And you know, off the back of all this, I've, I've essentially built a business out of it. So um, for a living, I provide uh, insights, consultancy to the higher education sector, maybe uh, ma- mainly the, the UK, because that's where I am. Um, but increasingly, I'm finding I'm doing more speaking gigs in the in the US and with US audiences. So, yeah, it's uh, good to speak with you today. And I'm sure we've got lots to pick up on on the higher ed side. Absolutely. And it's it's funny, you mentioned that your first newsletter subscriber list was about eight people. And then if you look <laughs> at the the open rate and you're like, 100% open rate, yay, my friends opened my newsletter. So you've got that going for you. The, there's you're, the, the, then the numbers just go down from there, right? Performance marketing is what it is, unfortunately. But the you know there's I I think that's amazing to just kind of bootstrap a following and and to develop your content. Uh, for those you know who are not familiar, uh, we were talking as we were getting started here about publishing content on LinkedIn. I will say mm-hmm. that. One of the main things that brought us together was your content on LinkedIn specifically. You are a master at it as far as creating digestible nuggets, creating really good insights, high level detail. So if you're not following Kyle on LinkedIn after the podcast today, go ahead and go on LinkedIn and do that. Um, I'd love for you to kind of share, let's let's start there around your philosophy. And I know we talked a little bit at the, at the beginning, but just around keeping it fresh and keeping it because I think there's lessons that we can learn there that institutions can apply to their own content strategy. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, the, the, the thing that for me, uh, and that always makes my, I guess my content distinctive is I, I always try and bring a, a lens or a point of view to what I'm looking at. I talk about education, marketing trends and, and topics. Um, and there's a fair few creators who, who do do the same, but the, the key thing for me is that I'm always checking and reading and what's going on i've subscribed to like my own email inbox probably about 100 newsletters or different sources of information and the 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 ability to create posts off the back of it is i'm sorry there's no shortcut you've, you've got to do the reading you've, you've got to immerse yourself in this stuff and you know I, I'm, I'm easily reading like 12 hours a week to to do this full time and to have a consultancy business and be able to create content on a daily basis and you know, the value comes when I've read something, I haven't written anything down, but I remember reading it and I make the connection with something else. And then this comes together into a, to a post. And then I apply like the, the education marketing lens. I've got over a decade of experience of being an education marketer before I was a, a consultant. So it's those different things that come together to get that momentum going. And mm-hmm. like most creation processes, it, it's, a, it's a question of habit. And if you do something every day for like two months, suddenly you start to feel sick if you don't keep doing it, right? And it's, it's a bit of a hack because most people think, oh, I'm not going to post every day. I'll do it you know, two or three times a week. And that's fine. There's no problem with it. But it's much harder to turn that into a habit where you're creating for an audience with a niche topical mm-hmm. idea and focus um, if you don't do it every day and you get better quicker if you do it every day as well. So, you know, practicing in public has been a huge thing for me. Um, and you wouldn't, you wouldn't believe it, but you know, before, before all of this, I, I used to hate publishing on LinkedIn or, you know, even, um, being like the person who's out in the front and doing speaking gigs and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. It's, I mean, I'm an introvert, you know, I'll say it and you can do this as an introvert. It just requires more energy, but you're never going to get that confidence unless you're practicing in public and honing your craft and are willing to put yourself slightly at risk. You need the feedback. Yeah. 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 It's, there's a certain vulnerability in publishing content, publishing your thoughts. Right. And I, and there's, especially in today's age when there's keyboard warriors out there that might disagree with something that you say, I don't think that when we're talking about higher education, marketing content, we're not, we're going to ruffle a whole bunch of feathers when it comes to because I feel like the unfortunate reality is like a lot of the times we're saying the same things over and over again for years to drive incremental change. And I know that's where, that's where I personally get frustrated sometimes, right? Where it's like, I see people sharing content that is in line with what people who've been around have been talking about for eight, 10 years, as if it's new findings and new details. But in reality, it's like, we've been talking about this forever. Why are, why are we not doing these things yet? Right. And so mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. what drives you nuts when it comes to sharing of content and the action or lack of action or 
maybe there's conflicting advice in the space. I think there's a lot, you know, with so much content, with so much opportunity to get access to information and content, it's articles, it's blog posts, it's podcasts, it's, you know, white papers, it's all of those things. What, what drives you nuts when it comes to trying to digest the, some of these things or see your advice actually hold true and cause action in the, in the world? In terms of content practices that drive me nuts or common ad- advice, if that's what we're getting at here, um, I, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of content marketing and I've built my whole business on these, these structures and these, these processes, right? But I keep, I keep seeing people talking about lead funnels and you know people moving from discovery down this narrow path to, to purchase. And, and I almost think it's a quite... Um, arrogant way to think about marketing um no one comes in the top of your funnel and moves seamlessly through your automation sequence mm-hmm. to a decision I, I can't believe we still measure our performance based on this and how many mqls we have at the top leads going in and conversion rates the, the reality is people aren't getting their information piecemeal throughout your nurture journey i mean mm-hmm. what a weird way to think about it your nurture keeping people warm these are weird phrases right and how people make a decision today is just vastly different to how it was even 10 years ago. So 10 years ago, you know, you'd have to go through like a school or an institution to get a lot of information. You request information, a prospectus or a pack, you share your data and this information's sent mm-hmm. out to you via mail or whatever it is. Today, any student, any consumer goes online, they read customer reviews, they go into communities, they yep. ask their peers on digital networks, it's trackable to an extent, and we could probably talk about ways to do it later, but the the marketing journey, the majority of it is happening in this dark space that no one's really looking at or building initiatives for, like WhatsApp groups, like building out thought leaders, podcasts and stuff, but in a real a business-focused way. And we're still playing in this space of running campaigns and mm-hmm. lead gates and know running white papers or whatever it is to try and get information and then hound people into making a decision and then we go oh it was the white paper that did it 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 really isn't and this drives me nuts because i've built my business in this way where i provide meaningful content every every day at least i I aspire to, to do that and i hope my audience you know sees that um and i know how hard it is and how different we need to be thinking and it's not mm-hmm. like these things only can work in my sort of business. They can work at an institutional level. Your universities are filled with thought leaders who are experts in topical areas. If anything, a university is ideally positioned to run these strategies. Right. Yeah. I just don't see it. I think. I think what you know, if we look at it the lens of, I, I'll, I'll well, I'll put that aside for a second. One thing I want to say in response to that is. I feel what's what's interesting is, and I don't know how it is in with at schools in the UK, but at schools in in the US, a lot of uh, a lot of what happens is is for whatever reason when we walk into the door of the admissions office to sit down to talk about our communication strategy for the following year, we magically forget that students are consumers too, right? And we forget our own experiences as consumers and being marketed too. We hate it when we get a, a an, an unsolicited email from a vendor trying to get a meeting mm. with us. We hate it when we get a phone call from a vendor trying to set up time to meet with us at a conference when we didn't say we wanted any information from vendors. We hate a yeah. direct mail coming into our mailbox. And then all of a sudden, when we build communication plans to recruit students, it's well, we need to send direct mail. We should be calling them. We, we need should to do this campaign. Sending them. We should have this email campaign. And it's like, you know, there's something that we, something we just forget when we walk in the door and there's challenges there. And there, that's, that's something that, that's the, to answer the question of driving me nuts. That's the kind of stuff that drives me nuts. And to put the, the context of what you talked about before with, you know, the funnel, sales funnel in a business world is no different than the recruitment funnel in an admissions, mm. in, in admissions department world. We might use different terms, MQLs, SQLs, prospects, le- or, you know, inquiries, you know, applicants, et cetera. But it's the same thing. It's a buying yeah. journey and it's a, it's a process of an under, it's just the product is different. The product's significantly more expensive than a Snickers bar, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a product purchasing decision where the student has to now make that and you know, but it, it's it's a unique decision because there's the parent influencers there's the peer influencers which mm-hmm. is unique on top of other things but the key lesson remains that it's not a funnel 
it's a it's a it's a series of streams that cross back and forth. And I feel like that's where content marketing from a higher ed perspective can have a lot of impact because it's not just the push email campaign or the nudging text message campaign. It's responsive to text messaging campaigns. Mm. It's resp- it's personalized content, not just first name, but content that's based on where they are in the process and things that they're interested in. We have all of this information from yeah. various sources that we get. We oftentimes ignore it because it takes a little bit more work to use it than to just do it the way we've always been doing it. Um, that's my soapbox moment. I'll, I'll let you respond. It's interesting you, you mentioned the text side of things. Um, again, I think this is a not just text, I'm talking about instant messaging and things like that. I, I just think these are vastly underutilized channels. And I, I look at data from like GWI, and these have got global surveys of social media use and application use from all kinds of like all kinds of different territories. But WhatsApp is like the world's favorite app. You wouldn't believe it, right? But th- this simple little messenger is uniform, you know, globally recognized as the world's favorite app. It's always in the top 10 most downloaded there's loads of initiatives coming into the instant messenger space in the moment that m- brings them outside of this just one-to-one or group chat space and into things uh, and into territory like Substack. you know whatsapp's experimenting with launching newsletters in that environment because people are so used now to consuming content in that instant messenger uh I- I- environment that, that these, mm-hmm. these services finally have a have a hook we have broadcast communities being introduced to WhatsApp. I've been speaking to a few university clients about building out experiences in these areas, just as ways to disseminate information to, to students. Uh, you know, we often struggle to get students to read campus updates, emails, and we can probably talk about email in a bit, because I think that's also misunderstood as a channel. But, mm-hmm. you know, rather than sending out these emails that you're struggling to get people to read, how about you just have a WhatsApp community if you're your current students where you just share updates. You don't even need to reply. It's just a place they can go when they want to to find out what's going on you know, in, in the instant. So there's all kinds of stuff like this happening, you know, loads of developments going on in the space. Um, which would be really useful to, to higher ed. But again, changing those behaviors and the knowledge is we could just do a campus-wide email. We could just target students yeah. based on this segment with email uh, and moving that into an instant messenger space is, is a challenge. And I, and I recognize that. But potentially the returns from doing that and making that move, okay, it's painful, but you're going to get probably 80% of people actually reading this stuff versus like, you know, yeah. uh, nine or 10%. So it's well, worth and it goes, it goes back to in the, a bu- another buzzwordy thing in the industry right now is, you know, feeling that sense of community. Right. And that's not mm-hmm. really, it's not really buzzwordy. Cause it's been, that's, that's been the reason why students choose a school is because of fit, right. They, that's why they come to visit campus. That's why. And so there's, but once they're there, especially I feel like getting, getting through, you know, the, the post COVID world, we'll call it, there's a yeah. lot of, isolation issues there's a lot of self you know sense of belonging challenges mm-hmm. that that students are facing right now and so sending them an email about campus updates that they don't that they they get in a sea of other emails mm. is not necessarily going to help those other challenges we have to think differently about the ways that we're engaging current students and prospective students and parents and there's a lot and we could do 10 podcasts on this topic, but yeah. it's and still and still only scratch the surface, but there's a lot of thinking that needs to be put into the developing of the of the content plan in a way that's engaging, meaningful, and actually adds value. Um, because otherwise you're just creating a, a sea of noise. Um, I'll, so I'll I'll lay a, I'll I'll lay out a situation for you and then I'll kick you back on the email piece because I, I this is an area where a lot of people still have challenges to this yeah. day. Again, we hate getting unsolicited spam emails, but we send e blasts up the wazoo to to prospect lists, right? So it's <laughs> it, it's a it's a interesting scenario, but you know the challenge I I see is there there are a lot of folks in the space and in the industry that want to do things the right way, right? They want to segment their list, they want to personalize the content, they want to have a, a you know a a tailored message and a tailored plan. The problem is is that there are so many bad actors in the space. That even when you have that super highly targeted, well-crafted email with an amazing subject line, yeah. it's in the sea of unread emails that they're getting because everybody's buying the same lists. Everybody's recruiting the same pros- prospect pool of students, especially with diminishing demographics in the U.S. And we have that, the, that whole shift happening. So if you're, if you're 
advising someone on email marketing as a segment of their plan, and maybe that's a key to it as a segment of the plan. What is the, you know, what are your thoughts there on how to stand out in a sea of, and when you're the only good actor in a sea of bad actors, how, how do you, how do you really stand out in that, in that process? I think having an, an element of an individual in your communication is essential. Um, and I'm basing this success off my own. You know, I, I've, I've built an email newsletter and I think I've gone against every good practice that is expected of email marketing to create that property. And yeah, you know, to give you an idea of its performance, um, you know, and, and I'm aware that you can't really measure open rates as well as you could say two years ago now, yeah. but most of my clients are Microsoft, so they're not using Apple based Apple based products. Uh, for the audience, Apple essentially have, have blocked open open rates. You can't you can't retail yeah. anymore. Um, but for Microsoft, it's not quite the case. So my email open rate is usually in between the forty and fifty percent. Um, you know, when I had my eight friends, it was a lot higher than that. But I've managed to consistently keep it between forty and fifty uh, percent. And my click through rate is something ridiculous, like thirty five percent as well. And I don't even spend a minute thinking about subject lines. I just put my newsletter number in them and education marketing newsletter, you know, all these things, no images, it's just text-based. And, you know, the value is it's turned up every week at the same time. It's consistent, mm -hmm. has a message. It's, it's speaking to a niche. And there's no reason why a school couldn't take that template and apply it to say a student who's applying for a subject in, I don't know, X entrepreneurship or whatever that subject is, right? Maybe they're applying for a, a degree in business management. It's a little bit different in the UK if the type of qualifications are studied, but you can create that consistent touch point. You, you can connect with a student at a familiar time. It can come from an academic or a, a student who's written that content, or at least looks like it's written by a, a person and presented in a way that it feels like it's written by a person rather than you get this promotional email that has the banner at the top. Yeah. It's got my name in like a different font because it's not pulled through on like the automation system yeah. correctly. Now I don't use anything like that in my email newsletters. I don't talk to my subscribers by name. Could it be creepy? Right. But how do I know their name? I, I haven't earned the right to use their name. They've just subscribed to my newsletter because it provides valuable content. I, Valid I think point. the same philosophy should be applied when we're talking to students. If I read my name in a personalized communication now, I just say, oh, this just, that's just weird. It, it just doesn't feel very right in, in 2023. But you can make something personal by talking about the things that are relevant to someone. And you know, if I think if we take that thinking and we apply it to subject groups and we take these these CRM processes a bit more seriously rather than just sending out the degenerate communications about the school and student life and actually mm -hmm. tailor stuff, I think that's where the value is to change um, how people respond to emails. We get the reason, we've got problems with open rates and engagement because we're just simply sending out the generic stuff that every other school is. If we actually took the time to craft properly tailored comms to a subject area that students interested in, they'd read them, they'd yep. open them. And, and, and I think it's so. where it also comes down to be a, a multi-touch and multi-channel type of a Indeed. strategy too, yep. right? I think, you know, PII laws don't allow you to know who the person you're advertising to via Google or Facebook or whatever is, right? So it, when you do those types of advertising, they're anonymized. You're not saying, mm. hey, Kyle, come explore the business program, right? Yep. You're, you're, but if you've segmented your audiences and your lookalike audiences most effectively via those channels, you can serve business ads to business prospects and arts yep. and sciences ads to arts and science or marine biology, whatever, name the, name the major. And so there's, there's a portion, there's a portion of that of having a consistent experience, but that means that you put the work in to segment yes. your audiences. And I think historically, everyone would blame the CRM, right? The CRM, it's impossible for us to do that. It's really hard to do, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, when everybody's drinking the slate Kool-Aid or everything else, and they, 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 these are the best systems in the world or the most, if they're that good, use them that way and, or find a firm that helps to build them that way and leverage it, right? And so it's, you know, I think that there's a benefit to having a, you know, putting the work in to really think about your customer segmentation and customer segmentation being prospective students and parents, right? And how, how, what cadence you're communicating to them with, what content, and it's a little extra work on the front end, like you said, but when your yield goes up and your conversion rates go up and everything is better and you don't have to buy as many names, your, but your budget is better. Your team is working with better applications. So you're not overstretching your team. 
everything would be better if we we put in that little bit of extra effort. And for a lot of people, honestly, listening to the podcast, probably speaking to the choir, right? These are people who we want to do it that way. The challenge is we are dealing with campus culture. We're dealing with you know technology issues. We're dealing with mm. so the last you know I I I, I want to be cognizant of your time and everyone's listening this time. Last thing I'll ask is, you know, how, do, how would you advise people to, to push back against those, those issues and barriers? Because the reality is every conversation I have, I have at conferences and I meet with people, this all makes sense. It all, it, it's all smart. It's a, it's the way we want to do it, but right. And how do we deal with the, but and get past that and start to, to make these types of changes when we have, you know, a glacially slow moving organizational culture that is higher ed. Yeah, I mean, there's a number of ways to, to deal with this. Um, and, you know, as, as a content marketer, often when I, I go into universities, I'm, I'm talking about building long term programs that deliver RRI over an extended period. It's not like a campaign where you instantly get return on that investment and sometimes not much of a return. Right. Um, yeah. But what I found is that you have to first, I know it sounds cliched, but I, I'm always very upfront about the payback period window and I assign numbers and, and meaningful metrics to it from the start. So what I've come across with campaigns and you know different uh, design choices and stuff, I've gone in to talk to teams and when they've spoken with stakeholders, they, they've bought stakeholders a couple of options of what a campaign can look like. This is what and campaign A can look like versus campaign B. But there's no there's no metrics given to the stakeholder time how long until they can expect return what, what mm -hmm. sort of uh, pipeline velocity will we get how many students potentially you know or what will even be the the positive signs that a, con a content campaign or a marketing campaign is is working none of this stuff is really shared and i find that quite surprising especially from my time working in like a, a SaaS environment so what i do with content marketing is the first thing i say is look if you want any return from this podcast or this you know, YouTube series we're doing, if you really want to do it, it's going to be between 12 and 18 months before you get any return. If you want something quicker, if you want something that's going to immediately return some sort of results, you probably want to go down a different marketing campaign route. And I, I give people the option of, of those two choices. And usually what they want is a content offer these days. So as long as you say up front and at least set that expectation, it's a lot easier to defend your place when someone rings you up from like a month later and say, well, why haven't I got 50 students from my podcast yep. that's got five listeners at the moment? So, you know, that's the sort of conversations that I have. And even with like base metrics of how many students you expect in that payback period, at least people are on the same page. So you can point people to that as you move through that process. That's I know it's really basic, but yeah, you know, hey. sometimes that's what it is, right? We forget the basics sometimes. I, 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 you know, speaking earlier about LinkedIn content, one of the things that I put on LinkedIn last week or so now, when this podcast drops, it would be a few weeks ago at this point. So go, go sifting through my LinkedIn and find it. But it's about, you know, it's about the marketing department, right? And how in businesses, all it takes is one soft quarter, sometimes even one soft month for everybody to turn to marketing and say, hey, what's marketing doing? Why aren't we getting enough leads? Or why aren't we getting enough? Yeah. Why aren't these leads converting, right? And if you're not tracking your outcomes and you're not building and you're not self-advocating and communicating the plan up front, then you're on defense when those types of things happen. Because every business faces a tough quarter. Every business faces a, every institution faces a tough enrollment cycle, right? It just, mm -hmm. it happens. And so in order to protect yourself and your, and your budget line and your resources, you've got to advocate and communicate the plan. And I think that's a, a big part of it. And, and that helps to manage expectations. And I think not over-promising on the front end. Yeah, you want immediate results? Maybe we don't do the thought leadership campaign. If you want to just drive leads, maybe we need to do a, a really you know good digital advertising campaign to drive traffic to a high-performing page, right? Like there's there are different ways to to use your, re, your resources based on the goals. And you got to understand what those are. And there's a huge educational piece to it as well, because we have been conditioned to thinking that we run a campaign in October and then we measure the return on that campaign in January, right? So these really short windows and education is a, it's a very expensive product and it's a long tail decision process. You, yep. You're just not going to see the return from activity you do within a few, within a few months. So 
you know, talking to you know your, your stakeholders about how the marketing journey's changed, maybe even dropping the phrase post-COVID to give it some grounding or whatever you need to do. But how people buy today is radically different to how it was even just five years ago. We're, we're much more embedded in digital communities and we're always considering stuff. We, we don't move through pipelines, especially for complicated products like education. So I'd always factor in, you know, give them the, the payback window, sure, and give your metrics. But especially if you're dealing with a stakeholder who's maybe, you know, their, their, their expertise is... Um, faculty is it's academic you, you need mm-hmm. to share with them how marketing works right it's it, yep. it's not how they probably think yeah it's not hey we, we're launching this program in march and we need a class for the fall of 30 students right like that yeah yeah and everyone's running into those problems unfortunately mm-hmm. oh right. so we could we could like i said we could do a podcast series about this maybe we will at some point down the line who knows but uh, i want to thank you for your time, for being here today, Kyle, I appreciate your insights and your thoughts and all of the advice that you shared with our listeners. Last opportunity for, for those who are listening, best ways to connect with you, follow up with you, stay in touch, subscribe. All of this will be in the speaker in the, all of this will be in the episode notes as well, but want to, I want you to give you, give you an opportunity to share all methods, smoke signals and at all to be able to connect with you. Well, naturally LinkedIn, I think I spend most of my waking hours on there. Um, so anytime, just message me there. Um, but I also have a website, educationmarketer.co.uk, and you can subscribe to my my newsletter there as well if you want something uh, that comes to your inbox weekly. Awesome. And like I said, we will put all those links and details in the episode notes for our podcast listeners. So thank you so much, Kyle, again, for your time. Appreciate everyone listening. And we will see you next time, FYI.